Greetings in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Once again, it's my pleasure and privilege to share the Word of God with you. Uh, we have begun a new series uh, called Foundations, you know, and uh, we are doing that. Years ago, we uh, had a series called Back to the Basics, and we taught so many truths that were very transformational. And we want to revisit those truths in a fresh light. So I don't want you, any one of you to miss the series. Uh, please listen, you know, and engage with it. Uh, don't just listen, but engage with these truths from your heart. Uh, it's so important that we do that. And last week we saw uh, about the truth of all truths. Truth of all truths. Theologians, you know, have this phrase. There are so many truths. Um, in fact, the word truth is the word reality. Greek is aletheia. So meaning every truth is a reality. It is so important that we get this. Every truth is a reality. It is not a presupposition. It is not a doctrine. It is not a thought. It is not a concept. It is not an idea. It is not a, a teaching truth is reality. I want you to understand. Every truth is reality. And so the truth of all truths, meaning the reality of all realities. So what is the reality of all realities? See, this is the whole question, right? The problem is because of the fact that our perception becomes our reality. Our perception is our reality, but it is not necessarily the reality, right? It is our perception is our reality and it is not the reality. So when our perception changes, our reality changes, which is good, right? Otherwise, we are stuck in our own world. So our perception changes as we know the reality. The reality is unchanging. This reality is unchanging. So what is the reality that is unchanging? You might think, you know, the evil in this world is reality. Pain in the world is a reality. Suffering in this world is a reality. Um, unfair people, unjust people, you know, and death and decay and confusion, chaos, my goodness, especially, you know, what's happening around the world. We might think all those as realities. In one sense, it is, you know, it is a hard reality uh, that is that we are facing day in and day out. But it is not the reality because all these realities can change. What is the unchanging reality where we can make it, which we can be assured of? What is the unchanging reality of the fabric of the universe? See, that is, that is what we are talking about. That's what we say, truth of all truths, reality of all realities. What is that reality? So I, I told you, you know, everything is a created reality. Earth is a created reality. Heaven is a created reality. But what is the uncreated reality? Uncreated reality is the reality, right? The uncreated is the reality. What is the uncreated? Everything else is created. So whatever is created is subject to change. Whatever is uncreated is eternal, right? Uncreated is eternal. 
no beginning no end so what is that reality and that reality is is father right son and holy spirit right so you have the father you have the son and you have the holy spirit and this interpenetrating right interpenetrating circles right you can put it this way or this way uh so you have here right this one this father the son and the holy spirit okay this one right here father <laughs> why am i redoing the whole thing again and again and again and again did are you noticing something the way my hand moves right see it is unending right i keep going keep going keep going whichever way and it goes on and on and on and on and on and that unending interpenetrating circle of relationship is what the early church father called as perichoresis perichoresis or the triune dance or the circle dance and this relationship is the reality so how we see your see god is so important this relational reality right right here father son holy spirit right father son holy spirit father son holy spirit okay this reality right here this relational reality you should understand something is a relational reality what kind of relationship strictly other centered self emptying or self giving mutual indwelling delight celebration joy laughter so this this relational reality of other centered self emptying self giving mutual indwelling mutual delight joy celebration and laughter this is war we call whatever you want to call right you this is eternal life right here this is the holiness this is god's holiness this is love whatever you see you know ultimately this relational reality is what we call god you should understand this this is so 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 important you can't miss this if you miss this you miss everything right when we say god where do we start where do we start you know is a very interesting question when we say god where do we start because you see the bible narrates the truth of who god is in a very particular way many people argue the word trinity is not in the bible 
it's for a reason that why I believe Holy Spirit has not put the word there. Uh, because, you know, we are very used to systematic theology, right? So we would have been happy if this book, instead of it being in the format it is right now, we would have been much happier if this book is in the form of, uh, what do you say, uh, systematic theology. The first chapter is God is. And point number one is he is Trinity. He is like this, two, three, three. Then sin is. Then this, you know, it would have been much easier for us and we would have been very happy if that God has given us a book of presuppositional truths, right? You know, it, it, it is just abstract truths and just put it in, in terms of principles, in terms of methods, in terms of formulas. We want God sorted it out that way. And that is exactly why God did not give us such a book. God has given us a narrative which has got myriads of views of God people's own understanding and everything. And then finally Jesus comes into the pictures, uh, questions it and reveals certain things. So the narrative is so rich and we need to flow with that narrative and get into the mind of the apostles, especially the New Testament writers of how they figured out, you know, this triune God. It is so interesting and so fascinating when you go, go on that journey like that, rather than trying to read the Bible as a book of principles and formulas. Right? Just imagine, you know, in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. We have Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God. Right? In the beginning, Elohim created. And from there, you come to John 1 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So between these two verses, right, from Genesis 1 to John 1, 1, lies the entire OT narrative, right, lies the entire OT narrative, then you have incarnation, the entire incarnation, all the way to ascension and Pentecost, you know, so uh, from virgin birth, from virgin birth, to death, burial and resurrection and cross and then ultimately, you know, the Holy Spirit coming down on day of Pentecost. You have the entire thing, right? You have the entire thing in John's mind when he is coming to this conclusion. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was, the word was with God and the Word was God. Do you know this is such a blasphemous statement to make in a monotheistic culture, right? Because Judaism is strictly monotheistic. For them, God is one. Oh, hear, O Israel, God is one. This, this, is, this is their theme. This is what OT narrative is all about. God, our God is one. Our God is one, you know. Our God is the only true God. He is the only true God. You guys have so many gods. You know, their charge against the pantheistic religion is that you guys have got so many gods. We have got one God. We have got one God. Is their main narrative. And the prophecy is that that one God will come in flesh. That one God will come in flesh. And he himself will come in flesh and rescue uh, Israel from all its trouble. Right? That is their belief. So the Lord himself will come. The Lord himself will, you know, become the salvation. So that is the prophetic uh, expectation. So their Lord God is one. Okay? 
and that Lord God will be flesh is their expectation. And here comes Jesus, you know, and he says, I am the Messiah, meaning I am the Lord God in flesh. And guess what? That, that's not the problem because that's all they, they all expected that. They expected the Lord God who is one, you know, will become flesh. That's what they all expected. But what they didn't expect, what was really, what really rocked their world is the fact that this Jesus, who he called himself as the Messiah, came and said, my father. So this is where the whole problem uh, of the first century came. So they were like, okay, if this Jesus is calling someone else as the father, then he is not probably God. He is some lesser, lesser version of God or whatever his reason. You know, they were trying to uh, really make sense of how this Jesus calling you know, my father. And then he says, okay, I'm going to the father again and I will send another helper. I will send another helper and comforter and I'll send the spirit. Spirit is also, you know, uh, God uh, is one and he is a spirit is the Old Testament narrative. So he, he speaks spirit, he speaks the father. So when he said these things, the whole monotheistic understanding got really shaken. So, so Christianity was kind of locking, you know, horns in one sense with Judaism, which is very monotheistic. And on the other hand, you know, uh, pantheistic culture where there are many gods. But Christianity kept saying, or Christianity is a, a wrong word, right? It's not a religion. The early church, the early church, the early church fathers, were, you know, they fought tooth and toenail to say, no, we are monotheistic in our core belief. Our God is one. Our God is one. But our God existed forever in three persons. That is the conclusion that the apostles have come and that through which Everything else is reinterpreted right now. Are you getting what I'm saying? Our God is one. That is what monotheistic belief is all about. And then they said, okay, this logos of God, which is the word, by whom and through whom all things were created. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. So when the New Testament authors time and again kept saying, Jesus created all things, come with me to John 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning, and he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. My goodness. This is John, right? Come with me to Colossians, verse 15. Chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created. By him. There are in heaven, there are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. Okay? In him. So here you have, we are talking, so when we talk our conversation, when we begin our conversation with God, where do we begin? Do we begin in the Genesis or do we begin with, you know, God appearing in the burning bush with Moses or do we begin with God speaking to Abraham? Now, where do we begin our conversation with 
regarding God and be assured that we will not go wrong. That's what the New Testament answers. The New Testament answer, we begin with Jesus because he is the image of the invisible God. He came from God and he is also, he is, he is God, right? So all things were created. So the entire creation, both visible and invisible, is through him, by him, for him and in him, which is nothing but, you know, if the entire creation is through him, by him and for him and in him, and if he existed before creation and in him all things consist, he has to be God. Although no man can take this place, right? So this word, this logos, through which everything was created, by which everything was created, for, for which for, is created, in him was created, was not uh, it, the word, was a person. And he was with, he was with God and he is God. Are you guys getting what I'm telling? So that means this word, Jesus, the son, He has a father. Whom he is in relationship through the spirit. Right? He was born of the spirit. Everything is through the spirit. So you have the father. You have the son. And you have the spirit. Wow. This is really getting good. Wow. That means the father to be father, there has to be son always. And for the son to be son, there has to be a father always. So there was no point in time where only father was there. Are you getting what I'm telling? So this whole God is one. The New Testament authors redefined what this one is. This word is one. is not numerical unity, but relational oneness. This relational oneness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this relational oneness, that relational oneness is what we call God. Are you guys getting what I'm telling? They are not individually God apart from the relationship. This is so important. They are not individually God apart from the relationship. But the very relational oneness, that relational reality, that's what we are calling God. And when we say with, the father was with the son, the son was with the father, we are talking about face to face. Face to face. And this Jesus comes and says certain things which blew the mind of religion. Pharisees saw God so irritated. So irritated, right? See, you should understand something. The entire Old Testament, God as a father just comes 15 times. And he is a father to Israel and father to the king of Israel, which is nothing but a representation of Israel. No man called God as father. The fatherhood of God is 
there in the Old Testament, but it is in the background. But even though it is in the background, no one called call God father. Abraham never called God as father. Elijah, Moses, whoever it is, you know, uh, nobody called him father. So, there is this God who is almighty. That's the revelation that Abraham had. I'm God almighty. I'm God El Shaddai. I'm God El Elyon. You know, you can put all the L, 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 all the names of God you can there. You know, you, you have all these God, uh, uh, names of God and revelations of who God is, but you don't find anyone calling him Father. Okay? So this God, when he comes on the mountain, the whole mountain shakes, and, uh, you know, uh, even the so-called high priest, can only go to the holiest of holies once in a year. Um, so there is, in one sense, this God was in the midst of Israel, but there was a distance. Okay? There was a close, there was a closeness compared to all other gods who don't even know where they are. Right? Um, uh, the Greeks worship gods. We don't know. Gods are fighting there and and we are a result of that fight and we are caught up in their fight. That's their understanding of their worldview. In pantheism, everything is God. God is impersonal. Everything is God. Therefore, there is no meaning of relationship or anything. There is no meaning to anything. That's why it's called Maya. It's called illusion. Why? Because everything is impersonal. Anything and everything is God. This, 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 this. And there is no difference between this and this. Me. And this, everything is just one chaotic bubble and you are just lost in that. Uh, that is the understanding of pantheism. And you know, in a myriads of worldview, Israel claimed that God is in their midst, that God camps in their midst. So there is closeness, but at the same time, there is a distance. Okay, this God is close, but nobody can really become very close. That's the reason they can't even write the name God like this. They have to write G dash D or, you know, whatever, Y, W or Yahweh, you know, uh, they, they're this God. Yes. We, have one, we are worshipping one true God. Every other nation is just lost in darkness. Gentiles do not know who God is. But we know who our God is. Our God is in our midst. There is his tabernacle. There is his glory. Okay, but we really cannot go really close to him because it's very dangerous to go, to go close to him. So that's the whole OT understanding of how God works. Are you, are you, are you, are you following what I'm saying? It's so important that you follow uh, my teaching. Um, otherwise, you're going to miss, miss the whole train of thought that I'm trying to have. And here comes Jesus. In the heel of the Old Testament narrative. Saying he is from the, is from the bosom of Israel's God. And not only that, he calls him father. In fact, in Aramaic, he would have called him Abba. So when Jesus opened his mouth and said, My Abba, my Abba, my Abba. So in OT, you have 15 times the word Father is mentioned. In New Testament, the Father comes at a more than 170 times in the New Testament. And almost near 100 times comes in the Gospel of John. Okay. Uh, so many times. 
So here comes Jesus and flips the whole thing and he says, I know my father, this God whom you're worshipping, I know him. That's okay. That's okay for him to tell that. Okay. Basically, he was saying, your God is my Abba. But with, if, he had, if he had said that, that's, that is a problematic in itself, but it wouldn't have caused much problem. And he says, second thing he says is, no one knows it. Israel takes pride in saying, we know God, Gentiles do not know God. That is their whole thing. They, that's what they are puffed up with pride. That's what they made them call Gentiles as dogs. Because we know God. God speaks to us. God has given us his law. We have a covenant with God. We have, you know, Abraham has a covenant with God. Sign of circumcision. So sign of circumcision and the law. Right? So these are the two badges that Israel were wearing. Law and circumcision. These are the two badges that Israel was wearing with pride. This is Israel's pride. That we have God. God has given us his law. God has given us a sign of the covenant. You know, we are Israel. We know God. Oh, nobody else knows God. You guys are all dogs. You guys are all outsiders. You guys are all Gentiles. You don't have covenant. You don't have the law. You don't have this. You don't have that. But we have him. And Jesus comes into Jerusalem in all places. Stands there and says, no one knows him. And everybody goes mad. When he says no one knows him, basically he made Israel as Gentiles. And he drew a circle and he put himself in that circle with the father and says no one knows the father except the son. All of you guys Yes, you have this, you have that, you have this, da, da, da. you have the law, you have the circumcision, you have the temple, you have the sacrifice, blah, 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 blah. But you guys do not know the father. When he said that, everybody got crazy. Everybody got crazy. Right? He speaks with, with a, what do you say? With a level of intimacy that scared people. He spoke with a level of assurance that scared people. Are you getting what I'm saying? He spoke with a level of intimacy with the Father that blew the daylights out of people. Come with me to John 5. I want you guys to go and just read John and note every sentence there that where Jesus talks about the Father. Just pause there and let that word sink into you. Do that this week. Okay? That can transform your life. You just need to take the Gospel of John and just read through the whole thing. And wherever is Jesus is talking about the Father and the Father is talking about Jesus, you need to pause and just look at it. Chapter 5, verse 16. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. The law, the circumcision, Sabbath, these were all Israel's pride. They were religiously keeping those things. And Jesus comes and heals on the Sabbath. Religion is really bad. Religion hates you with a hatred that nobody else can hate you with. 17. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. 
<laughs> look, look at the way he is talking. My father is working and I have been working. This God commanded them not to work on Sabbath. And you are telling your father is also working and therefore you are working. I mean, what about the commandment that we have? What about the scrolls that we have? What about the years of tradition that we have? How can you talk as if you know that we do not know something? That you know something that we do not know? Verse 18, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. I don't know whether you are understanding what I am saying. When Jesus stood there and said about that shook the religious world. I'm telling you the revelation that he is your father is the revelation that religion doesn't want you to get. Because once you get that revelation, religion loses its business. Yeah. Institutional church loses its business when you know the father. Because they cannot control you anymore. They cannot manipulate you with fear. They cannot make you do what they want you to do. Uh, you know, nothing of such sort will work when you know the Father. Religion hates this truth with hatred. When you call him daddy, when they are afraid because the fear of God. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I've given a... a Series on fear of God. I do believe in fear of God. Please go and listen to the series if you want. So I'm all for the fear of God. The fear of God that Jesus had. Right? The fear of God that Jesus had was born out of this intimacy and assurance. This closeness that he has with the Father. That is called the fear of God that Jesus had. And I'm all for that, okay? But the fear that religion is trying to bring in about God is a very unhealthy fear and it is a demonic fear. And they need that kind of fear in the, in the lives of people so that they can control and manipulate them. So when some fellow stands and says, I know this God, he is my dad. I know him personally. That really shocks them. And that makes them feel when you say he is my father, you are making yourself equal with him. Making yourself equal with him. Verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you. See this whole verily, verily, most assuredly. Uh, the word verily, verily in King James. The Greek word is the word Amen. Okay? The Greek word is Amen. Amen, Amen, I say unto you. Usually, just like how in church, when we say something, when the pastor says something, when the teacher, whoever is teaching, saying something, who says Amen? The people say Amen. So people say Amen. Yes, we agree to it. We say, Jesus is the guy who says Amen to what he says. He is not expecting them to say Amen. He says, Amen, Amen, I say to you. He's saying, I am my own witness. I know what I'm talking about and you guys don't know what I'm talking about. Amen, amen, I say to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the father do for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. The context is, there was this guy who was waiting in the Bethesda for 38 long years. And 
There was no rest in his life, right? He was nowhere to move, but there was no rest in his soul. Yeah, he was physically resting because he can't even move. He is just stuck in that place for 38 years near the pool where everybody else is getting their breakthrough and their miracle. And this guy, can you imagine the mindset, the pressure, the stress that guy would have gone through sitting there 38 years, seeing everybody else getting healed and he, him not able to reach out for his breakthrough and no one able to help him. Everybody has given up on him. Nobody is there to push him inside the water when the angel stirs up. Uh, nobody loves him, cares him enough to do that. And he has lost all hope. And that guy has got no Sabbath. In his soul, that guy has got no rest. Yeah, everybody takes rest and celebrates Sabbath. And he has got nothing to celebrate. He's just sitting there every day. He is, cannot move. He cannot move. He has not moved for 38 years. And Jesus walks into that pool of Bethesda. And looks at that guy and says, take up your bed and walk. Take up your bed and walk. And that guy moved on the day of Sabbath. And finally he entered into Sabbath. Finally he entered into rest. And the religion was so angry that Jesus broke the Sabbath. But Jesus brought Sabbath to that guy. Brought the rest of God into that guy's life. And why? And he's telling. And when they are about to kill him, they're trying to kill him. Why he healed? He, why? He, you know, nobody was happy that, you know, Jesus healed this guy. This guy, 38 years, he's healed. No, no. How can you break Sabbath? Is the whole anger of, of religion. That's the, religion is so bad. Uh, what they have to celebrate, they will, you know, kill. And what they have to kill, they will celebrate. And for which Jesus is replying, Hey guys, the Father is working and I'm working. And I do what I see the Father is doing. And guess what? The Father was the one who wants this guy healed. There is no difference between Jesus and the Father. People think God gives sickness to teach you something. They are saying those things because they know, they know the God of Job. They know God of Moses, but they do not know the father of Jesus. They do not know the father of Jesus. So many people can say so many things from, from the Bible saying God is like this, God is like that. And the Bible faithfully records all of those things, all of those views of God. Because it is not scared of presenting it that way and saying and contrasting it with the vision of the Father in the person of Jesus. Through which every other voices are silenced. And Bible faithfully recorded, records all of the voices because that's the voice that's running in our head. That's the voice that's running in our head. That's the whisper of evil. That's the voice of the enemy trying to misrepresent God. Verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. That all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. These are all huge statements to make. John chapter 6, verse 57. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. 
See that statement? I live because of the Father. I live because of the Father. Chapter 7, verse 27 says, However, we know where this man is from. But when Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. We know he is from Nazareth. But when Christ comes, no one knows where he is from because he is from God. He is, you know, he is God himself in flesh. So no one will know where he is from. But we know him. You know, he is son of uh, Joseph. You know, he is from Nazareth. Uh, he can't be Christ. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, You both know me and you know where I am from. Meaning, you know where I am from, from Nazareth. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true. Whom you do not know. Look at the audacity. Look at the audacity that Jesus has to stand in the temple in Jerusalem. Which has a rich tradition of years and years of people who knew God. To stand there and say, you guys, yeah, all of you do not know him. None of you know him. But I know him. For I am from him. And he sent me. <laughs> Therefore, they sought to take him, meaning finish him out, take him out. See, this is the taken that I'm talking about. They sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because the hour had, his hour had not yet come. Chapter 8, verse 14 onwards. Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. See, that's the thing, right? He's saying, Amen, Amen. He is just bearing witness to himself. And Pharisees had a problem. Verse 13, it says, The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Only by two or three other witnesses, anything is confirmed. Right? That's the Old Testament law. By the two, mouth of two or three, it is confirmed. But you are bearing witness of yourself. So your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. My goodness. I like this guy. The word says... Only by the mouth of two or three, you are confirmed, right? Jesus acknowledges that too. He is not destroying that. But he is not taking that as a principle and he is stuck by that. And he says, I bear witness of myself. And these guys says, then that is not true. He says, hey guys, let me tell you, tell you something. Even if I bear witness of myself, it is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. See the point? They are saying, you know where you came from. You are from Nazareth. You are from Nazareth. Jesus is saying, you guys really do not know where I came from. And you don't even know where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone. But I am with a father who sent me. I am not alone. Wow. Wow. I am not alone. The Father is with me. The Father knows me. The Father is with me. The Father shows me all things. The Father has given me all things. Look at the statements that Jesus is making. The Father knows me. The Father is with me. The Father shows me all things. You judge according to the flesh. My judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one who bears witness of myself. And the Father who sent me bears witness of me. <laughs> See how he uses that law. He says, hey, by two witnesses, right? I am one of the witness about me. And the other witness is the Father. These guys are going like, Ooh. Then they said to him, where is your Father? Jesus answered, you neither, you know neither me nor my Father. My goodness. If he had known me, you would have known my father also. These were Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one laid his hand on, on him for his hour had not yet come. My goodness. At the treasury, he was going near the money box. <laughs> and was telling, 
hey, you guys are collecting money in the name of God, doing all these things. But you guys really do not know him. But I know him and he knows me. Oh my goodness, that would have put Jesus in trouble. Look at verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But my Father taught me, I speak these things. So he knows me, he is with me, he shows me, he teaches me. He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. See how many times he is saying, I am not alone. I am not alone. I am not alone. The Father has not left me alone for, look at this, for I always do those things that please him. This is super duper important. For I always do those things that please him. Jesus did not have a Ten Commandments. Jesus did not have a book, you know, to find out, oh, what pleases God. Okay. You know, he was not, he read scriptures. He loved scriptures. But the way he read scriptures, he loved scriptures. And the way Pharisees loved scriptures and read scriptures is, is miles apart. It's, it's, Poles apart. You know, it, it's aeons apart. The Father knows the Son. The Son knows the Father. And He reads scriptures from that vantage point. Therefore, he, when things are not in line with the character of the Father that He knew, He's like, oh, okay, I know what this thing means. It really doesn't mean that thing. I can go and heal people on the Sabbath. How he interpreted scripture is not because of the Greek knowledge and the Hebrew knowledge and all these things. See, that's where Saul was gaining his knowledge about scriptures and about God through scriptures. Right? At the feet of Gamaliel. So Saul was studying scriptures. Saul was living during the time of Jesus, right? But you don't even see him coming near Jesus. Why? For him, this guy is a lunatic. You know, this guy, you know. No, I, I want to know God. And he went to Gamaliel and sat under the feet of Gamaliel and he was studying scriptures while Jesus was roaming the streets and he didn't even go near Jesus. Amazing, right? How religion can come in between you and the Father. Come with me to chapter 10. Let's read from verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Look how he speaks about the father and about his sheep. My sheep knows my voice and nobody can snatch them out of my hand. My father is greater than all and nobody can snatch them out of his hand. And look at the punchline, verse 30. He not only knows me, he is with me, he shows me, he, te he teaches me, he sent me, he has given me all things, I am not alone, da 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 He is greater than all. Here is the punchline, right? I and my father are one. Whoa! That's it. All demons started manifesting. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. <laughs> Come with me to Matthew, Matthew 11. Look at verse 27, 11, 27 in the Passion Translation. You have entrusted me with all that you are and all that you have. He's telling the Father, you have entrusted me with all that you are and all that you have. That's what being a son is. 
this he looks at the father and says father you have entrusted me with all that you are and all that you have my goodness and he says no one fully and intimately knows the son except the father and no one fully and intimately knows the father except the son no one but the son is able to unveil the father to anyone he chooses here is the gospel the gospel is this unique knowledge that the son has about the father he wants to share it with us he wants to share it with us how he wants to share it how he has already shared it and how do we partake of that knowledge all those things i'll share in the coming weeks but i'll just give you a clue okay i have a relationship with my son okay at times he used to just you know come in stealth and just jump on me and you know he will do all those things and just imagine he is bringing his friend along with him to my house to play and uh will i play with that friend his friend as much as i play with my son yes yes i will play with him but that friend that little boy is participating of the relationship between me and my son he is not there to build a new relationship with me by knowing me he is there because of an existing relationship and to participate of it so he knows my son because he knows my son now he kind of knows me because he is participating of my son's knowledge of his father are you getting what i'm telling so that's what jesus says if you know me you would know my father this thing is fully relational there is nothing legal about it that there is nothing transactional about it there is nothing principle you know about to this whole thing trying to make it all into those things is all the work of religion because we are so afraid of relationships we are so afraid of such intimacy we are so, because this kind of you know i will be showing why we are so afraid of these things in the coming weeks because this really scares us this kind of knowledge scares us we are happy with principles okay how to receive your healing 10 steps to receive your healings uh five steps for your financial breakthrough oh seven steps for this you know we are okay with such teachings because we have kind of control here he says i love you no matter what i love you i love you i love you and his love is going to expose all our insecurities all our fears and everything about us is going to come out and we are supposed to face it and then we have a choice to make whether we are going to believe this or believe his love about us my goodness i can't wait to teach you about the cross in this context and i can't wait to teach you about this communion in that context there is nothing legal there is nothing transactional about the cross it's the heart core love of the father and the spirit being revealed in the son in them reaching to us in our darkness and revealing the father to us we do not know you but thank you jesus for sharing your knowledge with us give us the grace to believe your knowledge give us the grace to say amen when you say that you have never left us alone 
In Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. See, um, I've been telling, you know, so many years now that um, building a building for a Sunday service doesn't make sense, right? It's a waste of money, according to me, where you just use it for Sunday. It's such a large building you build. And just one little room that you'll be using during the week, uh, I, I think it's a waste of money and waste of resources. But we need to build buildings. We need to build schools. We need to build community centers, which will reach out to communities, serve the community, empower the community. And, and the facility should be such a way where we gather there and relationally spend time. So thinking uh, through all these things, we have began our life of project. So that's where our future gathering is going to be. You know, uh, once all the gathering will be opened, that's where our gathering is going to be, which is going to be more relational in nature. I'll be sharing more about those things in the coming days. Um, it's going to be a learning center, an innovation center. Not only that, you know, in that locality, we are... Uh, surveying right now uh, how to reach out to that local community, how we can empower the local kids and the women there. Uh, so it's going to be a community center. It's going to be a learning center. And it's going to be our venue for our relational gatherings too. So that's the vision of the building. Uh, I want you guys to have a look at this video. And I want you to partner with me in this vision. All right? See you. You know, when we say we are building the house of God, when we are, we are building the church of God, um, people are all super excited to give because they think that they are doing it for God. But we know better that those things are not the house of God and we are the house of God. But we are supposed to build buildings and we are supposed to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit in wisely um, stewarding our resources and building things that matters to his heart to, to, to the vision of the transformation of nations. So if you have heard the Spirit and if you understand our vision, I want you to partner with us. We need two crores to finish this building and it is nothing for, uh, for the Father. See, it says, right? Whatever He is and whatever He has, He is entrusting that with us. So it's not a big thing. So we are here to finish this thing, trusting God. If you hear from God, if God puts it in your heart to partner with us in this vision, we really appreciate you do that. Take a look at this video. At the end of the video, you will have the account details. God bless you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm standing here right at the place where Life Up is going to be located. You see the kids playing there? Right there is going to be the main building coming up. Finally, we have begun our construction work. Guess what? The building project is more like planting a tree that is going to bless generations with its shade. To plant a tree, you would dig deep to plant the seed. Similarly, for the building, you would dig deep to lay down the foundations. We need to clear the site of any debris, pull out unwanted stuff and put down solid foundations in which the whole structure is going to stand. Working with these kids is just like that. It's more precious and important than the building itself. Here, we dig deep into their precious little hearts, root out the debris of lies about their identity, and lay rock-solid values as foundations of their lives. Soon, they would all be grown and become the future of our nation. I'm so excited in this journey to see their lives transformed. Moreover, it is not just going to be a place where we work on these kids. It will be a place where a beautiful multi-generational community thrives. Where the young and the old play together, celebrate together and grow together. Our vision is to build this learning center and make it an innovation hub where solutions to many real world crises are found. Not only that, once we are able to finish the complete project with labs and equipments, 
We are planning to invite the kids from the local community who are underprivileged to come and learn for free in the evenings. Conduct workshops for robotics and coding for them. We see a tremendous opportunity to work with the local community and empower them. I want to invite you to be part of this adventure. We need two crores to finish this building. And I encourage you to be part of this by donating whatever amount you can. Remember, the seed that you sow bears fruit for generations to come. Together, we can make a difference. God bless you.